Hi, my name is Peter Chin Hong. I'm an infectious disease doctor and a faculty member at UCSF. Today I'm going to talk to you about urethritis and cervicitis. These are our learning objectives for this module. Again, we will review the organizational framework which will guide you throughout the whole section on sexually transmitted infections. In this section, we will explore the causes of urethritis and cervicitis, the second box of three boxes in which all STIs fit. Gonorrhea and chlamydia are the two most common causes of urethritis and cervicitis, so we will touch on clinical manifestations, diagnostic strategies, and treatment. Again, our favorite pathogen map is shown here, and the organisms in red that we are going to focus on in this talk. These are gonococcus and chlamydia trachomatis. Again, here is our scaffold for this section. Think three boxes. And the focus is on the urethritis and cervicitis box. Overall, urethritis and cervicitis are characterized by discharge, dysuria, or more commonly, no symptoms at all. There are multiple etiologic agents in implicated, but treatment is usually directed against Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trachomatis. Have you stamped out gonorrhea today? I kind of like this severe image from the Library of Congress, don't you? Let's start with chlamydia. Chlamydia are obligate intracellular bacteria, meaning that they can only grow inside of cells. They lack the ability to make sufficient energy to grow independently and require host ATP. To consolidate some of your chlamydia knowledge, here are a few fun facts. There are three main species of chlamydia, th chlamydia trachomatis, chlamydia pneumoniae, and chlamydia psittacae. One of these will be the focus of this talk, chlamydia trachomatis, which is the cause of genital tract infections. The others cause trachoma, which is blindness in uh, many parts of the world, including Africa, atypical pneumonia, and psittacosis. Psittacosis is associated with exposure to parakeets and other birds. Chlamydia has an interesting life cycle. An extracellular inert elementary body enters an epithelial cell, which changes into a reticulate body. This divides by binary fission. Reticulate bodies then change into elementary bodies, which are hardy and now released into the environment, ready to infect other epithelial cells. Large, cytopl large cytoplasmic inclusions can develop and can be visualized. And here they are. The chlamydia variety that causes genital tract infections is chlamydia trachomatis, which are types D to K. The different flavors of genital tract infections are urethritis predominantly, but also LGV or lymphogranuloma venerum, neonatal conjunctivitis, and pneumonitis. Diagnose genital tract infections via PCR and treat with doxycycline or azithromycin. A proportion of patients who have chlamydia trachomatis genital tract infection will develop reactive arthritis. This was formerly known as Ritis syndrome and is characterized by post-infection uveitis, urethritis, and arthritis. This is caused by antibodies formed against the chlamydia trachomatis cross-reacting with antigens on the cells of the urethra, the joints, and the uveal tract. There are other bacteria that are also associated with reactive arthritis, and they are usually the enteric organisms such as Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter. Remember, patients can't see, can't pee, and can't bend the knee in Ritter syndrome. Let's now move on to gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea also called GC or gonococcus, is a gram-negative diplococcus that is the second most common sexually transmitted infection. Pili are the most important virulence factors in GC because they mediate attachment to mucosal cell surfaces and are antiphagocytic. Gonococci infect mucosal surfaces on the vagina and urethra and can disseminate. A higher proportion of men have symptoms compared to women, interestingly. The wide array of disease manifestations include for men urethritis, epididymitis, and prostatitis, 
for women. These include cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease with associated Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Both men and women can have disseminated disease manifested with septic arthritis or tenosynovitis with a rash, and infants can have conjunctivitis. Note that chlamydia is a co-pathogen in 15 to 20% of GC cases, so conceptually speaking, we treat chlamydia every time we diagnose GC, but not vice versa. In the picture on the top, uh, this 1970 photograph reveals the presence of what was determined to be a gonococcal infection involving the cervix of a patient. Note that there is purulent discharge emanating from the cervical os and pooling in the vagina. The picture at the bottom shows hand arthritis that can occur in the setting of disseminated gonococcal infection. The microbiologic diagnosis of Neisseria gonorrhea can be made by a positive gram stain of gram-negative diplococci within PMNs in the urethral discharge of men. Another method is to culture clinical samples using Thayer Martin media. However, these days, nucleic acid testing or NAT testing is most frequently used for the diagnosis of Neisseria gonorrhea infection. Note that the treatment of gonorrhea is now more complicated as resistance has emerged and now we are faced with giving both ceftriaxone and azithromycin when just a few years ago ceftriaxone was all that was needed. This is a photomicrograph of a gram-stained urethral exudate sample from a male who presented with a case of urethritis. You can see numerous intracellular gram-negative Neisseria gonorrhea diplococci bacteria. Pelvic inflammatory disease is a consequence of chlamydia and gonorrhea as a polymicrobial infection with some involvement of anaerobes. The upper genital tract structures are typically involved, including the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. What happens is that the barrier of the endocervical canal is compromised by the cervicitis caused by GC or chlamydia, allowing the anaerobes to enter and ascend. That is why the antibody treatment target the likely organisms, not only Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis, but also anaerobes. These are the minimum clinical criteria for pelvic inflammatory disease, uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness or cervical motion tenderness. Note that the criteria are intentionally nonspecific, giving the risk of miss missing PID. We typically would hospitalize if a surgical emergency cannot be excluded, if there might be evidence of a tubo ovarian abscess, pregnancy, or if there's severe illness involving nausea, vomiting, high fevers. Finally, just a few words on neonatal conjunctivitis or ophthalmia neonatorum. This was a newborn with gonococcal ophthalmia neonatorum caused by a maternally transmitted gonococcal infection. Unless preventative measures are taken, this estimated that gonococcal uh, neonatal conjunctivitis will develop in 28% of infants born to women with gonorrhea. It affects the corneal epithelium causing microbial keratitis, ulceration, and perforation. We typically prophylax with uh, erythromycin ointment at delivery. Again, our three boxes. Thanks for your attention during this section on urethritis and cervicitis and the tour of chlamydia and gonococcus. Until next time.